Hello to you all, I'm Phil Liggett and welcome to the 85th edition of the Tour de France, one of the world's great annual sporting spectacles, which was first held back in 1903. And while France celebrated its final weekend of the Football World Cup on home ground, the race stayed with recent tradition of starting every other year in a foreign country, this time choosing Ireland for its first three days of racing. Overall, the race covers almost 4,000 kilometres during its three weeks on the road. Moving from Ireland to France after arriving at Cork, it then travels south to Po, where the mountains begin with the Pyrenees. Then it's east to the Alps before the final time trial and the traditional finish on the Champs-Élysées on August the 2nd. Hot favourite after his convincing win in 1997 was the German Jan Ulrich, but he arrived in Dublin, Ireland amid speculation that he was unfit and overweight after a winter of celebration. In fact, quite the opposite. He looked ready and fit for battle. Also in for his checkup was our prologue favourite, Chris Borman, and Gary Imlach was waiting for him. The nearest thing the Irish have to a home rider in this year's tour looked at home heading into his medical and probably felt it, having spent a fair part of his season so far searching for the source of his nagging health problems. The tour doctors seemed as anxious as anyone to coax a good performance out of him. Good, 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 keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Good. But despite the encouragement and what looked strangely like an attempt to give him a jump start, last year's prologue winner was guarded about his prospects for this year. I would say I'm likely to be in the top five. I might win. I think that's the way I'd put it. Um, sorry, folks. Hope you haven't put a bet on there, but uh, that's the way it is at the moment, and uh, I'll just give it my best shot. I've been extremely stuffy before, and, and it might just work out this year. If not you, who? If not me, uh, potentially Christoph Moreau uh, for Festina if he's riding. I'm not sure whether he's down. Um, Alano, obviously, but uh, more likely to be Zola. I think the main chance will come from Zola. He's very, very good at this type of event. And what about the course? Does it suit you? I'll tell you in a few minutes. I'm just off to see it. What he could see of it, given Dublin's rush hour traffic. The good news for Chris, though, is that at least the number 49 isn't running today. Well, Gary, I can assure you that the roads are closed now for everybody in this race. The best time has been done by Christophe Moreau of the Festina team. Six minutes, 17 seconds, but let's go to the action and the arrival of Alex Zuller here because he was pushing Moreau the same time at the halfway and Zuller's lost a little bit of time, Paul, on the running. 6.19.56, he'd be disappointed. Well, Christophe Moreau certainly won't be Paul. He's still number one. This is Abraham Olano now, a man who's come to the Tour this year with just a win in this race in mind. Certainly has his preparation exactly the same as Miguel Indurain's was over the last few years of his career. He's based everything on this one race, and he's based everything on the preparation of the Bonesto team, and he's off to a very quick start in a huge gear. 5.6 kilometers around the streets of Dublin, and it's nearly all over now for Bobby Julik. His time checks have been good, and Julik now wants to put an impression on this tour. Second time round for him. It's a long way to the finish from here, Phil, but he's going to push Christophe Moreau very close on the line. So coming up O'Connell Street now for Bobby Julik. It could be the first big surprise. A 6.17.29. It's the best time. It's only fractions of a second better, though, than Christophe Moreau. Now back to Abraham Olano. Out on the course, and the time checks are good. Well, Olano's riding a very good prologue. He is a good prologue time trialist, but the man everybody expects to do well is Britain's Chris Boardman, who's in the starting gate right now. So Chris Boardman, the fourth rider from the end to start today. The pressure on him. He comes from just across the Irish Sea near Liverpool. So he's the nearest they'll get to a local rider in the Tour de France this year. The pressure is clearly on him. A couple of days ago, I went to interview Boardman on the track in Manchester, Phil, and all he was doing was starts and one kilometres, two kilometres, three kilometres to get his speed up for this opening prologue time trial. For him, it's his major goal of this season. Well, if the crowd can lift him, that's the answer. Borman is underway while Abraham Olano is coming home. And it's going to be a great ride by Olano. He's thrown his hat into the ring with this one. He's going to beat Julik by a fraction of a second as well. Abraham Olano, 6.16, is number one. Julik drops to number two. Now, the yellow jersey of one year ago. And what a sensational win it was for Jan Ulrik. He's now on course. Lawrence Jalabert has been putting great performances in out on the course too. He was the fastest time at the midway checkpoint. And the new champion of France is coming up to the line now, Phil. And it could well be he's going to topple Abraham Alano. And Jalabert is not one of the great time trialists of the sport. 
Well, he's going to find O'Connell Street. It's a long, long straight here. As he comes up towards the line, he's going to be very close. He's just gone past it. Well, Jalabert has gone into the same second slot as both Julik and Moreau. Now, Jan Ulrich on course as well and riding like the wind. I don't see him looking too fat at all. Well, Ulrich's come to the Tour de France in right condition. Perfect, I think. You know, he was third in the prologue of the Tour of Switzerland just 14 days ago, and now he's out on the course. But Borman Phil was fastest at the halfway checkpoint. And he swings into O'Connell Street. He will see the line from there, but as I said, it's a long, long way to go now. Borman accelerating. He had a good split. He was fractionally quicker than Abraham Alano at the split out on the course. The seconds are indicating he could be on a winning ride here. Chris Borman racing for the line. He's won the prologue twice before. Now he's won it three times, 6.12.36. And there's still to finish the yellow jersey, but his time is down, Paul. Well, he's not matched Chris Borman at the halfway stage, but he has picked up a little bit over the closing kilometres, and this man has come to the Tour de France in great condition. That's the time to beat of Chris Borman, 6.12. He's not going to do that, but it's a pretty good time, Phil. As he comes up to the line, it's going to be very close indeed. It's be third place for Ulrich, 6.17, so he really has come to the Tour de France in good condition. Well, they don't come much tighter than that between third and six, but Chris Borman wins the prologue time trial for a third time. He equals Eddie Merckx and Tiddy Murray. Yeah, I'm absolutely shocked now, and it's a fantastic surprise. I, I really didn't expect to win today, but it, it was some ways it helped because it took the pressure off. I just decided to give it my best shot and see what happened. What percentage of your best were you out there? Well, I'd say it looked like it came right on the day, but even this morning I didn't feel so good, and normally I can predict myself quite well. Uh, the training hasn't been going great, but I just gave it everything, and the crowd really helped today. The noise was incredible. Almost like a home fixture out there. Yeah, absolutely, and I've never dedicated a win before but this one is for my wife without whom I wouldn't be here well, a great start for Chris Borman he did what he set out to do he won the prologue time trial the third time he's done that now he's got to defend the yellow jersey over the road races stages here in Ireland and the Dublin Dublin circuit race 180 kilometers will take the riders into the mountains of Wicklow still the pool the weather is not great but at least it's not raining well, at least it's not raining, and Borman's going to get a lot of challenges here from riders like Eric Zabel and Mario Cipollini, who in the overall standings are not too far behind him, but he looks pretty confident in the yellow jersey. Well, Ireland have turned out in their thousands here. This is the sprint at Bray, a little group here taking it out. Jan Zarada taking it ahead of Eric Zabel and Fred Moncassin. There's the result. Those time bonuses at this stage of the Tour de France are always so crucial. Onto the climb now. This is the climb of Wicklow Gap and a little breakaway still clear, headed by Zanini. Jens Voigt sat at the back here. Well, Jens Voigt is sitting here because he's the teammate of Chris Borman, who's the overall leader. He's not going to contribute anything at all to the success of this breakaway, and he'll sit at the back and hope they can stay clear because if they do, he'll be the man who'll be taking the yellow jersey this afternoon. But in the main field behind, it's Mario Cipollini's Seiko team who are on the front trying to pull it all back together. Well, pull it back, they are. This breakaway at one stage was over three minutes up. It's now down to inside two minutes. In fact, it's now down to 1.25, and the tempo being set. You see right down the slopes here of the mountain. It's an area which Stephen Roach spent many a mile training because he doesn't live too far away from here. Mirko Kripaldi from uh, Polti on the front there, and you can see the speed of the main field behind Phil. They want to pull it all back together because the sprinters want to have their day. Men like Zabel, Tom Steeles and Cipollini feel that these opening days of the Tour are the most important for them. Richard Varenk and his Festina team riding under something of a shadow at the moment with the arrest of their masseur, Willy Voigt and they found dope in his car over in Belgium. We're into the park, and there's the crash. It's just happened as they've come into the park, and down there, Paul, is Mario Cipollini. Looks like the fall was caused by a teammate. Well, that was Mori who went down in front of Cipollini. I couldn't see any reason at all for that crash. As they come to the line, though, they're all together, and Cipollini's a long way behind. And Steeles is on the front, and Tom Steeles has got his stage win. Tom Steeles, who was disqualified last year when he slung his bottle at Fred Moncassin, has come back the very first road race stage. He's taken it out in the sprint. So Steele's the champion of Belgium, a title he defended successfully just a few days ago, and this is how he did it. The new champion of Germany, Eric Zabel, looked to be getting his first stage win of the tour, but he'd gone far too early, and Steele's had timed it to perfection. The Australian Rabobank rider, Robbie McEwen, coming a little bit late, but going clear for third place, and the rest were distanced by three of the fastest finishers in the world. 
So Steeles times it right, Zabel mistimes it here, he went too soon for the line, it's a difficult finish in Phoenix Park, a very straight finish, and the best man to judge it gets the win, and today it was Tom Steeles. Overall, the sprinters had moved closer because of small time bonuses throughout the day, but Chris Borman kept the yellow jersey, just. And this is the starting town of Innes Courty with a huge crowd lining the route. In fact, a guard of honour provided by more than 2,000 of the Wexford pikemen. There's no doubt the Tour de France has been a great success here in Ireland. Is that right? Yeah! Everybody is happy. This is the biggest crowd so far, and the, and the crowds have been big, Paul. But now they're heading down the southeast corner of Ireland. This really is the hotbed of cycle racing in the region. It certainly is. Mario Cipollini stinging after that crash yesterday. 179th, 3 minutes, 53 seconds behind. But for him, he gets the chance today to go through Sean Kelly's hometown. So, next on the list is Carrick on Shore, the hometown of Sean Kelly. It is a beautiful little hamlet, and believe me, they've been looking forward to today. The town of Carrick is ready. You know, Phil, in the absence of a giant meteorite, and certainly there was none mentioned on this morning's short-range forecast, the tour is the biggest thing ever likely to hit Carrick on Shore. For a while, though, it looked like being a near miss. Originally, the organisers had the race route bypassing the centre of town because the west gate was deemed too narrow for the peloton. Eventually, an ancient stone which had survived the visit of Cromwell gave way to the French, and the race was free to pass through Sean Kelly Square, and incidentally, the pub belonged to the local councillor who'd led all the lobbying. Now, the campaign had nothing to do with the fact that uh, it meant the race was coming past uh, your bar. Oh, possibly a little bit. <laughs> it was very interesting. It's a dream come true for Carrick and myself in particular. I've been going to the Tour de France since 1980, following Sean since he turned professional. And to think that it passing by own front door, it's just unreal. 5,583 is the population of Carrick, and 5,582 of them were in place from early this morning, waiting for the one responsible for bringing them the race. God is on the way. God moves in luxurious ways these days, and the first sign that the long wait might be over was the Kelly helicopter coming in low over the houses. Then came news that he'd been spotted on the ground. Uh, since we've left Senate Scotland, it's just unbelievable. Uh, the people have turned out in here in Carrick on Shore. Uh, you know, they've come out in such fast numbers, it's just unbelievable. A day never, for, never to uh, forget. It wouldn't be coming through here only for Sean Kelly's and for Sean Kelly's history with the Tour de France. And Sean Kelly take, take all the credit for that, leave out government, anything at all. It would not be coming through Carrick on Shore. And from 7 to 77, they've turned out. A town in celebration indeed, and one of my favourite towns in Ireland, I have to say, but the race is flat out now, Paul, they're chasing the time bonuses, there's a crash there, and that looked to me like the yellow jersey has gone down, we're approaching the sprint at Yall, and I think that's Borman on the road. In fact, Race Radio, Phil, confirming it is Borman, he's down there on the left-hand side, somewhere you can just see the yellow jersey, he's down and he's not moving at all. Well, this is very, very sad indeed. What an exit from Ireland this is turning out to be. Chris Borman looks now as though he's out of the tour here. He had a very, very nasty fall indeed. I think he may well have hit that wall. Certainly he's stunned. Let's have a look if we can see what happened. He's about 10, 10 or 12 men down here. You suddenly see Borman come out of the line. That looks to me like a rider who's touched a back wheel. And this is another man who's so unlucky, Johan Brunel. Brunel is always getting involved in crashes, but Borman is still on the ground. The race doctor, Gerard Port, is there trying to see what the problem is, but Borman is not moving. Well, this is the sprint just down the road at Yall, and if Zabel gets this, and it looks like he's going to, he's being attacked by Greedy, but Zabel gets the sprint. He is, in any case now, the new Mayo Jean of the Tour de France, and he's done it at a time when Chris Borman is being taken out of the race by ambulance. Still chaos here, and Borman still lying on the ground. The doctor in there, he's actually trying to put something around Borman's neck, so there may well be a slight injury to the neck there, but Borman, for him, Phil, a difficult day at the Tour de France is over. Well, it certainly is unlucky 13 for Chris because it is the th he is the 13th rider to leave the Tour de France wearing a maillot jaune. So he'll be in Cork Hospital tonight, and let's hope he is OK. 
This is again another crash here. We've gone further down the road now. We're just outside of the finish at Cork. Another touch of wheels, and some of the big stars are down here. Now there's Neil Stevens, a stage winner last year, but they're all up and riding. No reports of injury. We're on the approach to the finish. A very tricky finish too now, they're all trying to set it up, the riders at the front now are from Gann, they're trying to set it up from Monkas, and this is Magnus Backstead. Well, Backstead leading out, he hopes Fred Monkas, and who's got a good wheel here, this is another difficult sprint to judge at the finish of Cork, and Backstead is giving it his best shot here, the big Swede, coming on to good form, but I'm not too sure whether he can hold it off now, we've also got Zanini here having a little dig. But where is Zarbel? Well, not uh, evident at the moment. Tom Steele is trying to burst through. Jan Zarada is also coming fast. Jan Zarada of the Czech team, and it looks as though it's going to be a tight battle, this one. McEwen is in there. Robbie McEwen is lying in. And we've got Cipollini trying in the red. But Cipollini is not going to get it anything like Jan Zarada takes it on the line. And so the Czech champion, a new Czech champion at that, gets the victory for Mape. Two out of two for them. Yellow jersey, though, has changed hands. Eric Zorbel has it now. He gets it by seven seconds ahead of Steeles, and Fred Moncassan is in third place. Alano, Jalabert, and Julik still in there by virtue of their great prologue time trial. Zorbel having a well-earned rest here. Marco Pantani there as well. They've got the luxury of flying across now to the French coast in Brittany, while the rest of the entourage, they're on the boats for the overnight crossing now to Roscoff and the Irish Paul are giving them a royal send-off here. They certainly are, red, white and blue, turning, taking the Tour de France back to the mainland for the first time this year anyway. And for stage three, 169 kilometres, we leave Roscoff heading down to Lorient, a real hotbed of French cycling. And the yellow jersey now on the shoulders of the German Eric Zorbel, and he's managed to do that without even winning a stage yet. The Mappe boys have won both road race stages so far. The race now without Chris Borman, overnight news is Chris is hurt, but not too badly. He has a broken wrist, in fact, and head injuries. Be okay. A difficult day for the riders left in the Tour de France, too, because the sun will be out, but the winds will play a major factor in the latter part of the afternoon, because this terrain around Brittany and this area of France here is very difficult and will promote attacks. A couple of small hills, and that's exactly what has happened, Paul. Nine riders getting away at 45 kilometres today as we head for Lorient, only the eighth time in tour history. We'll have finished there. This is Pascal Chanteur, one of the casino boys in the breakaway. Now they'll be looking to try and split it up there. Stuart O'Grady, a former world champion on the track, riding a very good Tour de France here. And the man a lot of Denmark think will perform well in this year's Tour de France, wearing 61, Bo Hamburger. Well, Hamburger has only got to worry, really, about the whereabouts at the finish of O'Grady because there will be a change of yellow jersey and one of them will get it today. Number 75 here is Vicente Garcia Costa of the Benesto team. And the blonde hair here being worn by Pascal Hervé, who's looking for the King of the Mountains lead today. All the riders from Festina decided to change their hair colour when they went to the French Championships just a week ago. And all the French riders this year in the Tour de France sporting that silvery-grey colour. I have to say that Hervé often looks like uh, Richard Varenc. Now they've all got the same colour hair. Commentator's nightmare. But here's Hervé now, and still being marked by Pascal Chanteur, who's going to put a lot of work into this breakaway. They were up to seven minutes at around 102 kilometres where the feeding station was, but it's come down now to just inside three. The important thing about this breakaway is the battle that's going to develop between O'Grady and George Hincapi because these two riders with a victory this afternoon would be the rider to put the yellow jersey on their shoulders. We haven't seen much of George Hincapi, but he's obviously thinking about the sprint at the finish because I think George is the fastest rider in this group. Well, it's nice to get a breakaway. We didn't get any successful breakaways over the two days of road racing in Ireland. But this breakaway is moving, 48 kilometres an hour, that's 30 miles an hour at the moment, uh, timed on the Hamburger's computer. And the nice steady tempo, there's an awful long way to go, but there's still plenty of flat roads before this race gets down to the mountains in Po. Stuart O'Grady has had a great season, he comes here having won his first ever stage race, the Pru Tour in Britain. And now, just 11 kilometres from the finish, he is starting to hunt for that yellow jersey. George Hincapie too having a great season looking resplendent in the champion of the United States jersey there he really did want to come back to Europe and wear that jersey and show it off to the Europeans because it is a great jersey and Hincapie looking for a victory this afternoon for the US Postal Service who really have come to this Tour de France with ambitions this year I'm well, talking of champions Paul no fewer than eight new national champions this year in the field and indeed uh, includes Bogart and Steeles who both defended their title successfully just before the tour began 
and they're all riding here. Herbe tonight should be in the polka dot jersey. He won the climb of the Côte de Châteauneuf de Faou. He also won the climb of the Côte de Roque de Treves. So he's looking for polka dot tonight for Festina, but they are still riding under the cloud of the arrest of their team masseur, Willy Voigt, on the Franco-Belgian border, where reportedly his car contained files of EPO. And that is going to take some explaining. Anyway, looking down at the breakaway here, the nine riders who have worked very well together, Jens Hepner's here for the telecom team, not exactly putting his weight behind the break, of course, because of Zabel being in yellow. Well, it's important for Hepner to make sure that he catches out any of the splits as we come towards the finish. The man on the front in green is Cabello, the winner of the stage of the Tour de France, when in fact it went to England in 1994. And he's a very good sprinter himself when it comes down to the fast finishes. But these riders now looking at the kilometres ticking away and Bo Hamburger slipping to the back. These riders have got a big advantage because they have two men in this group and they will be able to cover any of the attacks over the last few kilometres. Beautiful day now, huge crowds. Look at them on the roundabout here as we head into this northwest corner of France, an area which is made for cycling and has produced many stars. We're not too far away now from the home of uh, L'Enfer, of uh, Bernard Eno, rather, the great Breton, and Jean Rubic, who won the Tour de France in the late 40s. But this breakaway now, one of them is going to get yellow. The odds are, Paul, it will either be Hamburger or O'Grady, but it'll go down to the bonuses at the finish. It certainly will. It's going to be a very tricky situation. If they can keep it together, it will go to O'Grady or it will go to George Hincapi. But you can see these two riders from Casino riding very well together. Casino, the most successful team in Europe this year with over 40 wins to their credit, and they're still looking to win more. Sitting at the back there, Xavier Jean, newcomer to the Tour and a member of the La Française des Jeux team. Five kilometres to go now. Well, we expected somebody to try and get clear here because they're not all sprinters, in fact, very few of them are. Hincapi, well, as you say, Paul, he could snatch yellow with the right finish here, and he's been riding so strongly, he's become a different man these last few days since he won the US Championship. He certainly has a great victory by him. I think really served him on a plate by Lance Armstrong, who really is now on his way back to the top level of the sport. But Hincapi becoming very nervous now. And all of the time, Phil, you can see the rivalry between these two men. When Hincapi goes to the front, he's very quickly followed by Stuart O'Grady in the white Gan jersey. Those two men realize they need to get victory this afternoon to get the yellow jersey. Otherwise, it'll go to the Dane Bo Hamburger. Well, Hincapi came out this morning 28th, just 20 seconds off yellow, picked up four seconds in time bonuses, so he's getting closer. And now we've got the riders here into the town of Lorient, this beautiful fishing port, and uh, they're getting a little bit twitchy, but Chanteur, and somebody's gone, this is an attack by Vincente Garcia. Well, he had to go, I think, he's not renowned as a sprinter, but he's put in a fine turn of speed here. An excellent move there, just at the right time. It looks as if O'Grade is the man to respond afterwards. He's not going to get so close to the finish and let a break get ahead of him. And another man, too, coming across there. Garcia trying to go clear. This was his chance to get victory. There's O'Grady in second place. He's nailed him back. He's come back there. And there's Hepner in the pink jersey of Telecom. So he, too, now becoming very vigilant. So Hepner up into third place. A little split in the breakaway, but the fact that uh, Garcia has slowed down, they're all going to regroup here, I think. Hervé's going now down the left-hand side, a good move by him, a very smart tactician, Hervé. Even though there is a cloud over the Festina squad at the moment, they certainly are racing aggressively. Hervé may well have caught them off guard here, just like Neil Stevens did in last year's Tour de France, and the effort behind coming from the man from Telecom, Jens Hepner. Well, Hervé, briefly a leader and a stage winner in the Tour of Italy, not this year, last year. And now trying to get uh, what will not be a yellow jersey, but certainly will be a stage win, and the polka dot is coming his way anyway. But again, the riders chase down. Now, Hepner Paul has sat at the back of this breakaway, which has been away now, don't forget, for the best part of 120 kilometres, and he should be the freshest of the lot. He should be, but another move has gone there. This is a rider from the Francaise Desert, Javier Hon, and in fact, there, and again, Hepner is going behind him. Hervé has sat up now, but this man, young man from France, the youngest rider on the Francaise Desert team, and made an excellent move, and Hepner straight with him, looking very fresh. He looks extremely fresh the way he's marked in there. He's pedaled up as easy as you like. He's not going to help John until he's sure he's going to get caught. 
He's come through now, but he's moved over, and they're doing bit and bit. But I tell you what, uh, this little uh, young man here, he's so anxious to get on with it, and Hepner won't discourage him because he'll let him use all the energy he's got, constantly looking exactly who might be coming across the gap. Hepner rode his first tour, by the way, back in 1992. Something of a revelation then. He finished 10th overall. Inside, 1,000 metres to go, and Hepner is waiting. He's waiting. He'll be thinking about the sprint because last year he was in that sprint with Bart Voskamp where he was disqualified when both riders touched each other and Xavier Hoy has decided to open it up. Hepner in second position, it's ideal, but the group behind only fractions of a second off the mark. Well, they're trying to get across here. It's a difficult moment. It looks as though Hamburger, Hincapi and in fact O'Grady are going to get the same time in that chase group which I think will mean that Hamburger could be the man to profit most today. He's picked up bonuses along the route. But the stage win now, well, Hepner's been forced into the lead, so Xavier Chon may just well pick this one up here. But he's coming at him, but I don't think he's got anything left in those legs. There's tremendous speed in the former East German here. And Jens Hepner's going to salvage a stage victory, I think, but he's still a little way to go. He's still holding back. You got coming on the far left of the picture now, trying to get across the gap, but it's not going to happen. As Jens Hepner gets the stage win, his first ever in a Tour de France, and in second, third place will go Hincapi. The main field are coming in here, and Benesto are going to lead it home, I think. It looks as though it was greedy, it may well have brought them back in. But it was indeed a surprise stage win for Telecom, and the first ever for Jens Hepner here in Lorient. He gets the victory ahead of Xavier Jean. George Hincapi third, Hincapi looking good now. Oh uh, yeah, I feel strong. Uh, I just need to recover after today. I mean, we were out there all day, going 100 percent, and uh, better get a good night's sleep tonight. Do you feel as though you've got a stage win in you? I think so. Um, the team's riding really well, you know, and I, I feel strong. Um, just gotta get keep taking taking my chances. Uh, these big field sprints early in the week are, are pretty tough, you know, because everybody's so fresh. So. I feel my chances are better in uh, breakaways like this. Stuart O'Grady up to third, but how's the morale after the loss of Boardman? Oh, I mean, you know, it's pretty, it's obviously extremely disappointing to lose Chris, um, especially through a crash and especially when you got the yellow jersey. Um, but, you know, the positive thing is that he didn't break anything. You know, he's not, he's not uh, seriously injured and that he'll be back. And so the team go, has got to go on and, and the tour goes on. So now we've just got to make the best of what we can. Still an opportunity this week to get Gam back in yellow, though. Yeah, well, tomorrow I'm only a couple of seconds behind now, so, um, you know, I'll really be playing the, for the bonus sprints and see how we go. And for the moment, this is where he sits in third place, three seconds behind Bo Hamburger, the new leader, and George Hincapi for the US Postal right there in second place. We're now on the stage of four, Plouet to Cholet, Paul, 250 kilometres. It's the longest stage so far. It'll be a very long stage, but those intermediary sprints are going to be very important, especially for George Hincapie, Jens Hepner, and Stuart O'Grady, because the first one, O'Grady was fastest over the line, this time beating Eric Zabel, so that gives him the yellow jersey, but he's still got two more sprints out on the course. So he's converted his three seconds loss to his three seconds gain here. He wears the rainbow sleeves there of an ex-world champion. And now look at this at the next sprint. O'Grady led out brilliantly by Fred Moncasan. And now he has gone well clear in the lead. Jan Zarada popping in there for a third place. On the approach to the finish now, you can see the team starting to organize themselves. There's the psycho team for Mario Cipollini trying to get him up there. TVM there in the yellow jerseys on the left-hand side for Blylevens. And the man on the front, he's from Polti. They're trying to get it up for Fabrizio Guidi. So there are some great sprinters, if not all of them, in this year's Tour de France. And this isn't going to be an easy sprint either as they come down to the finish at Cholet. And there's been a crash on the corner as I speak, Paul. A touch of wheels again. George Hinkep is in there right in the middle, so his chances of going for a bonus at the end of this stage are gone. One or two riders going down there. I didn't see why it happened, but now the big lead out coming from TVM at the front. And right up there in position there is Mario Cipollini. Well, Cipollini in the slipstream. It looks as though he's dropped away here as we speak. Now inside 800 metres to go. Now TVM are feeling very confident. This is going to be a very difficult sprint here, but the TVM boys appear to have read it just right. No sign of Eric Zabel, no sign of Mario Cipollini. In fact, they're saying 
Cipollini has fallen. It was away from our cameras. But now there's just two riders left at the front here now. TVM and it's also a rider from Seiko now who's trying to get in on the act. He's realised that Cipollini is not there. Baldato Bob taking over now. Phil for Minali. Minali's up there into second place and Blyleven's coming by on the outside. But there, the two, Tom Steele's. Well, Max Shandri falling away from the hotline now as Manali tries to come up. Jan Zarada is here too, but Bly Levens is going to try and squeeze through the middle of them here. This could be his traditional win. He gets it on the line. Bly Levens, uh, Manali, Moncasam are all in that sprint, but it looked to me as though Bly Levens took it. Let's have a look again. Manali on the left of the picture here. As now, Jerome Blyleven, he always seems to get one stage win every year. He rode his first tour in 95, he won a stage. Now he's squeezing his way through an impossible gap. He gets it on the line. And Fred Monkasan there looks as though he'll have to do with fourth place. But Blyleven's pulled up a good one there. Having ridden his first tour in 95, he won in Dunkirk. Then next year he won in Besançon in 97 in Marennes. That was after a disqualification. Now he wins in Cholet in 1998. But the yellow jersey, that goes to Stuart O'Grady now. He becomes only the second Australian behind Phil Anderson to pull on the Mayo Jaune. And that's a great result for him. There's the overall. He's 11 seconds now ahead of Hamburger. And I wonder how he feels right now. Um, on top of the world at the moment. I mean, since I started cycling, it was a, a dream of mine. One to represent my country in the Olympic Games, and two to, you know, get a yellow jersey in the Tour de France, and it's happening. Well, yesterday it was uh, it was a very difficult situation yesterday out on the road because you and George Hincapie could have taken the yellow jersey if you'd both finished together uh, going over the line. Yeah, well, I had to finish in the first three to get the yellow jersey, and. I knew that opportunities didn't arrive like that very often and uh, I was so disappointed last night to be so close but so far away and I really didn't think that um, it was going to come together and for the bonus sprints today and when, it, when we got a sniff of the opportunity the team took it on full steam ahead and uh, it worked like a charm. It must have been very difficult for you out on the road too because you know George Hincapie, he's a very good sprinter as well and then you knew it was going to be head to head all the way. Yeah, it was just, um, I know George is very fast. We did the same thing a couple of weeks ago in the Pro Tour in England, and I got on top of him there, so I think I had a little bit of a uh, psychological boost over him, and also with big Magnus Backstead and Fred Monkerson leading me out. How can you lose? Now, were you worried because you'd taken the yellow jersey virtually out on the road, and then that breakaway went clear, and they had almost three and a half minutes at one stage? Yeah, well, that was the plan. We just, uh, you know, Big Eros was up there controlling everything. And he was always in communication with Roger Leger back in the car. And uh, we decided to give them a few minutes and then just kind of leave him out there, dangle out there. And then with 30k to go, we knew the big teams were going to come up for the sprint and really put the power on. And it worked well. Just besides the last bit, you know, getting caught up in the crash at the end, that wasn't quite in the plan. And, you know, luckily I had enough seconds. And how did it feel when you actually went out there on the podium and they put the yellow jersey on your shoulders for the first time? Oh, incredible. I want to do it again. I bet you do, Stewie. Well, there's the situation overall. 11 seconds, Hamburg and Hincapie locked together there. Jens Heppner still in fourth. And Pascal Hervé, the king of the mountains, he's lying in sixth place. Some of the favourites for you. Olano 17th, Ulrich 22nd at 122, Zula 23rd, Pantani way out at the moment, 143rd after his very poor prologue time trial. Perhaps he is looking for just stage wins. But, Paul, the news of the scandal continues. Well, everybody's expecting the team manager, Bruno Roussel, here, who's being pursued by some journalists, to be taken away by the police for questioning because, in fact, Willy Voot has accused the team management of being involved in a systematic doping plan. And he says he, the police haven't come to talk to him yet, but as soon as they do, they'll explain everything to them. So Bruno Roussel, who's actually often been seen as one of the nice men in the world of cycle racing, now the centre of what is clearly a scandal affecting the Festina team. We'll keep up to date with that as we go on to stage number five now, Cholet to Chateau, 228 and a half kilometers. And there he is, Paul. He looks pretty good for an Aussie, doesn't he? He certainly does, looking very comfortable. But you can see the sequel there of a crash on the left-hand side there. He went down in a little corner there, and this is how it happened. The rain was coming down in the first part of the stage. They went round and touched a couple of wheels, and Stuart O'Grady was down on the ground, but very shortly up again and riding. But for him, a difficult first day in the yellow jersey. And he's now had to fall back to the team car and have his knee looked at here. A little bit of a hole in his kneecap, in fact. As the race continues, he was looking at fall because Wilfred Peters won the six seconds bonus and his teammate Moncasan got the four seconds. So it hasn't affected his race lead at the moment as we're now running down towards the end of the stage. 
On the front there, Lauren Brochard trying to lead out the sprint. Philip Gomon from Cofidis in second position there, looking very good. He's been excellent in all the early sprints now, but it's the turn of Casino to wind it up, and Mario Cipollini's boys are on the left-hand side, also trying to give Mario Cipollini his first win. Well, he's certainly had his ups and downs in this tour, Mario. We've waited a long time to see him even challenge for the victory so far. He's fallen on two stage finishes, but now he's poised nicely, just centre left of our picture. And there was a nasty switch in the middle there. Looked as though it was caused by Jan Zarada, but he certainly kicked George Hincapi out of the way as they now continue for the line. As Zabel again has hit the front of Cipollini, challenges him. Eric Zabel, Cipollini clear of them all now and gets the win. It had to come sooner or later, and when it comes, he makes it look so easy and in fact uh, judging by the results here they have disqualified from the result uh, Jan Zarada he's been relegated the yellow jersey staying on the shoulders of Stuart O'Grady and uh, that will keep him very very sweet because we're heading down towards the time trial now he leads by seven seconds on Hinkab he got switched out of it there in that sprint Hamburger stays the same at 11 seconds as we now go on to stage number six La Chartre to Brive La Gaillarde Happy days are here again. I've always wanted to be a chef, and here I am in the village of La Chartre this morning, waiting for the start of the stage of the Tour de France, getting the pasta ready for everybody to enjoy. But you know, a year ago, a young Frenchman enjoyed his day here, Cedric Vasseur. He won the stage alone. He transformed literally overnight from a domestic to a French superstar. When he went back home to northern France, they were ready for him with a ticket take welcome. He was given the full treatment. Well, in this tour, Cedric Vasseur lies 65th, almost two minutes behind the race leader, Stuart O'Grady. Should he come down today to a sprint? Well, Vasseur won't be there, but Mario Cipollini should be. Danger is his business. And yesterday, Cipollini won his first stage of this year's tour. Behind him, another pileup, which left world track champion Silvio Martinello, Jerome Blylevens, and Jan Kersipu lying in the road. The green jersey leader, Jan Zarada, was blamed for that crash and was relegated from 12th to 180th. Well, yesterday, the French call that finish a sprint imperial. Mario Cipollini really is the best. How does he do it? He's Paul Sherwin to explain. The first requirement is a good set of thighs. 28 circumference is not bad for a start. Second is a big pair of lungs. In Mario Cipollini's case, nearly an 8-litre capacity. Third and most important, nerves of steel, which allow you never to panic, even when you get caught up in a situation like Super Mario did yesterday. Boxed in between Eric Zabel and Fabrizio Guidi, within sight of the line. The sprint of the 90 sprints with power, and Mario Cipollini's machine has a massive gear. A 53-tooth chainring at the front, combined with an 11-tooth sprocket at the rear, makes a very big gear. Mario Cipollini's physical attributes allow him to use that gear to accelerate from 50 kilometers an hour to 65 in the last 100 meters, leaving all his rivals trailing in his wake. And the riders coming to the start now, stage six, without Silvio Martinello, who actually fractured his pelvis in that crash which was caused by Jan Zverada. Well, Paul, it's a long way, 204 kilometers up to 2,000 feet today, so we can say it's the high spot of the tour so far. And a difficult day's racing in store. Although it is cloudy, the temperature climbing to 75 degrees Celsius in the latter part of the afternoon, and the winds coming from the northeast will make it very tricky on the run-in. Even so, no major climbs, uh, three-fourths categories and one-third. Mario Cipollini talking to the chief commissaire, Martin Brun. And uh, Mario has one stage win under the belt now, so he's won six stages in the Tour de France. While Stuart O'Grady hasn't won any, but he's got the yellow jersey for a third day. First sprint point of the day, it looks as if Jan Zverada is the man going out there to try and get the points, because he too is going to challenge Eric Zabel, who gets second place over the line, and O'Grady still looking for a few seconds to keep the yellow jersey on his shoulders in third. Well, O'Grady's always said he'll lose the race lead tomorrow in the time trial because he won't match the big hitters there, but he's going to hang on to it as long as possible and get the privilege of the last start tomorrow. Well, Jan Ulrich, 122 down, finally poised and looking like a real man who could defend his title this year. Same too for Abraham Alano, he could get it for the first time, but now, today, it won't be because this is a breakaway of three riders. Max Chiandri of Britain sitting at the back. We've also got Cedric Vasseur. He's now taking the pace up, and Jose Rodriguez of the Kelme team. None within a minute and a half of the race lead. 
Always a very strange day's racing the day before a time trial because all the big hitters of the Tour de France want to take a back seat and save as much energy as possible for them what is going to be the first most important rendezvous. And for Cedric Vasseur, definitely a great day remembering his day last year in La Chardre. And Max Chiandri here, if this group can keep the advantage they have, could find himself with the yellow jersey on his shoulders this afternoon. But coming up to the line, they're not actually going to sprint, Phil, because for them, the most important thing is to keep the time bonuses, the time advantage they have so far. Well, there's absolutely no point here at Chambry Eve. 164 kilometers covered. Chandri takes them through, and then comes Rodriguez and Vasseur in that order. But really, the attention here now is keeping this breakaway clear. But it won't happen because the main field is right on their heels, and they're almost all together now. They are all together on the streets of brive la gaillarde and it looks very much as if TVM are trying to lead up the sprint again for Blylebens, but this time it's Lars Mikkelsen on the front, giving a very big turner right behind him, the new champion of Russia, Sergei Ivanov. Well, Lars Mikkelsen, once winner of ghent wevelgem and now trying to have a good Tour de France here. But again, the sprinters are going to have their say, and the days are running out for the sprinters now. The mountains, the Pyrenees are not too far away. Another sharp left-hand bend, but Seiko have got the riders through on the inside, and Cipollini once again has got himself in the hunt here, and his tail is up after a victory yesterday. Well, Ivanov still on the front there, queuing up behind him. The Seiko riders coming along the outside now. Andrea Taffy trying to get up Zverada and also Tom Steeles. He's bumping in there. You can see the champion of Italy bumping alongside there, Mario Cipollini, but Cipollini's not giving him any way at all. And things getting a little too hot for Taffy now as he starts to fade out of it, going past the green jersey there of Eric Zabel. We still got the teammates of Cipollini trying to hold control of the pace and Ivanov still setting it, but you know he should look over his shoulder because he hasn't got Blylevens anywhere near him at the moment. In fact, he's got two Seiko guys and they look as though they're lining up for the finish now. They'll go around a sharp left-hand turn here. They slam on the brakes and hold it as late as possible. Cipollini goes round there very, very close to the green jersey of Eric Zorbel. In fact, he's one length behind him. Minali is just behind Cipollini and the attack's coming from the teammates on the far right. Guidi also having a little dig here. Now, this is the lead out by the sprint domestics as Zabo tries. Robbie McEwen's caught with a flyer on the outside as well. And well, there's a lot of work being left still to be done here. If uh, Zabo, McEwen, and Cipollini are going to get on terms. Now, Eric Zabo's seen the line. He's gone for it. Cipollini's got his wheel. Manali's right behind him. Bly Levens is there too. Now, look at this because Cipollini's coming over the top of Eric Zabo. He's misjudged it yet again in a sprint. And Manali was close. But on the line, Cipollini gets it too out of two days Minali must have got second and I think Jan Zorada got third there it looked like him but this was a very easy sprint finish again perfectly judged by Mario Cipollini Minali moves up onto the shoulder of Big Chippo but it doesn't matter because that man knows when he's measured it to absolute perfection Fred Moncasan beaten again when will he ever win a stage in a bike race he always finishes right up there but never number one Mario Cipollini will be very unhappy with anything but number one. He gets yet another win in the stage of the Tour de France. Number seven now for him. He's not far off the 25 he's got in the Giro d'Italia. There's the result. And Moncasan uh, uh, steals Travassoni, Bly Levens. That really was a sprint royale. George Hincapi there in 10th and a good 18th place for O'Grady. So he keeps his yellow jersey on the eve of the time trial. Nine seconds ahead of George Hincapi. Bo Hamburg a third, Jens Hepner a fourth. It'll be a strange start order tomorrow. Bestine and the world's number one team is out of the Tour de France. After more than a week of speculation and the arrest of the team's management, the riders themselves were last night sensationally thrown out as well. And this really is a black day for the Tour de France. The news broken last night by the Director General, Jean-Marie Leblanc. But more on the implications in a moment. And I have to say, in the 26 years I've reported on this tour, I've never known anything quite like it. Now, these are the facts which have led up to this unprecedented decision. July 8, Festina's team masseur, Willy Voigt, was arrested on the French-Belgian borders and found to be carrying 400 vials of various drugs, including steroids. July 11, the tour started in Ireland. The tour organization saying French justice must take its course. It has nothing to do with the tour. And the race started with the Festina team in attendance. The team's management was saying the arrested master was acting alone. July 13, 
Stories began to filter from France that arrested Willy Voigt had claimed he was carrying the products under the instruction of the team's manager, Bruno Roussel. July 15, when the race reached Cholet, police detained Roussel for questioning and also the team doctor, Eric Reichert. July 16, the world body, the Union Cycliste Internationale, ordered the suspension of Bruno Roussel's manager's license. July 17, Roussel is alleged to have confessed to police that he allowed the doping of his riders under controlled medical supervision. And on the strength of that, Jean-Marie Leblanc, the Director General of the Tour de France, made this statement. Monsieur, il est 22h50. Je sais bien que vous faites un métier difficile. Nous aussi parfois, parce que les informations que nous recevons sur ce Tour de France à propos de l'affaire Festina nous parviennent uniquement par la presse. Ce sont parfois des rumeurs, il y a parfois des contradictions, des interprétations. Et il y a une semaine en Irlande, nous vous avions dit qu'il fallait attendre que les faits soient euh, avérés pour prendre une position ou une décision officielle dans l'affaire Festina. Depuis, l'Union Cycliste Internationale, elle, a déjà pris la décision de retirer sa licence à Bruno Roussel. Et ce soir, à Brive, à partir de 18h, après l'arrivée, nous avons reçu, toujours par le canal de la presse, des informations en provenance de Lille. C'est ainsi que l'avocat de Bruno Roussel, M. Thibault de Montbrial, a fait une déclaration à la presse dans la journée, et je le cite. Guillemets. Bruno Roussel a expliqué aux enquêteurs lesquels avaient les éléments, les conditions dans lesquelles une gestion concertée de l'approvisionnement des coureurs en produits dopants était organisée entre la direction, les médecins, le soigneur et les coureurs. L'objectif était d'optimiser les performances sous strict contrôle médical afin d'éviter l'approvisionnement personnel sauvage des coureurs dans des conditions susceptibles de porter gravement atteinte à leur santé, comme ça a pu être le cas dans le passé. Fermez les guillemets. Ces quelques phrases nous ont paru terribles à nous, organisateurs du Tour de France, organisateurs de la plus grande compétition cycliste du monde, car elles constituent ni plus ni moins un aveu. L'aveu que le dopage avait cours dans l'équipe Festina et qu'il était même organisé. Cela nous a paru suffisamment grave, et lorsque je dis « nous », je parle de la direction du Tour de France, mais aussi des pouvoirs sportifs, représentés ici à mes côtés par le président du jury des commissaires de l'Union cycliste internationale, M. Martin Breugn, pour nous appuyer sur le règlement du Tour qui dit, article 29, je cite, la direction de l'épreuve se réserve le droit d'exclure du Tour de France tout coureur ou tout membre de la course convaincu d'avoir enfreint les principes généraux de l'épreuve. Et il me semble que l'éthique du sport, la moralité du Tour sont au premier rang de ces principes généraux de l'épreuve. C'est pourquoi, après avoir pris connaissance des derniers éléments euh, d'information émanant du tribunal de Lille, après les avoir longuement pesés, nous avons pris la décision d'exclure l'équipe Festina du Tour de France à compter de ce jour. Décision difficile car nous avons beaucoup pensé aux coureurs, mais décision qui nous paraissait être indispensable et que nous espérons salutaire, salutaire, et pour le Tour de France et pour le cyclisme, et qui, nous l'espérons aussi, mettra un terme au climat malsain qui régnait sur l'épreuve depuis le départ de Dublin. Voilà, merci messieurs. L'équipe Fessina est évidemment avertie de cette décision. Well, there are the facts, and Jean-Marie Leblanc shocking the world press last night at 10 minutes to 11 French time. Let's now go to Gary Imla, as he reports now from the Festina Hotel. This is the Chateau Castel Novel, a luxury hotel for those seeking peace and quiet. There's been neither here today, though, because instead of going quietly, the Festina team responded to the tour organization's announcement of their exclusion with an announcement of their own that they plan to try to ride today's time trial anyway. And that was the cue for a morning of frantic shuttle diplomacy. 
Shortly after 8.30, a helicopter delivered the tour's director, sportif Jean-Francois Pecheur, to the Chateau grounds, along with a senior official from cycling's ruling body, the UCI. They met with team leader Richard Varenk for about 20 minutes before heading into the annex where the rest of the Festina riders were staying. That meeting broke up with no comment from either riders or race officials. But as Pecheur flew back to the race start at Merignac with a Festina team official on board, the mechanics who'd been instructed to prepare the riders' bikes as usual in the morning had clearly got the word to take them out of the team truck and put them back. In Merignac, more discussions, this time involving the Director General of the Tour Organization, Jean-Marie Leblanc, and its President, Jean-Claude Keeley, only produced a restatement of their position. They are not allowed to take uh, the start in the, in the Tour today. But are you expecting them to arrive and try to take the start? I don't know. I don't know. I don't hope so, but... Back at the team hotel, acting manager Miguel Moreno announced a new development. The decision on whether to try to defy the ban would now be left up to the individual riders. The first Vestina man due off today, Armin Meyer, apparently decided against it, and his start time of 12.34 came and went without him. But just as it seemed that the chances of a confrontation were fading, a promised press conference was suddenly superseded by the reappearance of the mechanics, who attached the bikes to the team cars and the riders headed off, apparently in the direction of a head-on clash with the hierarchy of the Tour de France. Time, though, was clearly against them. Well, it's 18 minutes past two, which was to have been Neil Stevens' start time today, but as you can see, there's no sign of him in the start house, and apart from the continuing presence of their logos everywhere, it looks, after all the machinations of this morning, as though Festina's involvement in this year's tour is finally over. In fact, at the moment he should have been setting off, Stevens and his teammates were being told to their faces by Jean-Marie Leblanc the news that they'd previously refused to accept. They were out of the race, in the case of team leader Richard Varenk, in tears. Well, before we discuss how this might affect the sport of cycling and indeed the Tour de France, let's go to Paul Sherwin now as he looks into the background of the Festina team. The Festina team was formed in 1990, but their first appearance at the Tour de France was not until 1993. In 1998, such were their performances, they became the world's number one ranked cycling team. 39-year-old Bruno Roussel, who joined Festina in 1993, had been an amateur cyclist and coached the Parisian US Crete team. He entered the professional ranks in 1991 to manage the French RMO squad. Roussel brought Richard Viron to Festina after the withdrawal of RMO from sponsorship at the end of 1992. Virenk has consistently performed at the Tour de France, offering Festina four King of the Mountains titles in as many years. Laurent Brochard won the world title for the team last October in San Sebastian. With a budget of three and a half million pounds, Festina's biggest coup was the signing of top Swiss rider Alex Zuller during the winter transfer season. In their sixth participation in the Tour de France, they appeared to be the major contenders to Team Telecom's dominance. Well, I'm now joined by Paul Schoen, who, let's not forget, was a seven times rider in the Tour de France. Paul, just how rife is doping in the sport? Phil, I can only hope it's not as bad as the picture that's been painted over the last few days because it really has been painted as, as if all of the riders in the Tour de France have been taking drugs. I think what we'd have to remi remember is at the top of any sport, mm. people will always be tempted to cheat. And the trouble is they have controls here every day. They have random checks. They're coming up negative. Are these controls a waste of time? I think a lot of them are quite ineffectual because if you go back to the former days of the East Germans, there were always doctors who were one step ahead of the doping controls. And you think that the case of the top teams here, the doctors are in control of the teams? I think the reason the team doctors are here is to make sure that the rider's health is not uh, affected. Now what about the Tour de France itself? Does that mean that this race has no future now? The Tour de France will continue, the sport of cycling will continue because if you cast your mind back to 1988 and the Ben Johnson being positive in the Seoul Olympics, athletics is still around. Indeed it is and of course I'm just hoping that we can get rid of this cancer in the sport of cycling and let's hope that some good comes out of this and not only riders but officials get together and get rid of it. The Tour de France goes on and the best time at the moment in the finish house has been set by Tyler Hamilton of the US Postal Service with one hour 16 minutes and 35 seconds and now in the start house is the defending champion of the Tour.
So a moment uh, to compose himself for Jan Ulrich, asking the man holding him up to just straighten him up a little bit. As he now concentrates on pulling off a ride that should see him move up the overall classification tonight. He showed uh, a little bit of time trial form over the last four weeks in races in France and in Spain. But now he wants to pull out the big one. So Jan Ulrich is away. The first real test for him, Paul, since the prologue, I suppose, in Dublin. He's had an excellent tour start to this year's Tour de France. He's been very quiet, no problems at all. And today is the event where he is one of the great specialists of the time trial. And for the moment, he's looking very good indeed. But the time by Tyler Hamilton, Phil, at all the checkpoints was quite remarkable. He's the fastest man so far. Well, hats off to Tyler Hamilton. He really has pulled out a special ride there. But Ulrich is pushing him all of the way as he's now looking for a time that might match it. Hamilton's time, by the way, at the finish is 1 hour 16 minutes and 35 seconds, and Ulrich is running Hamilton, as you can see, pretty close here. He might well just go ahead of Tyler Hamilton's time. Tyler was fastest at every checkpoint. Now it's Ulrich, so he's on course. He's on course, Phil, but he's not doing the damage I think he would have expected to because he's only 35 seconds ahead of Tyler Hamilton. And coming up to the line, Bjarne Ries, the man from Denmark, 13th best time for him, 1 hour 19 minutes, 09. But look at the speed, almost 44 kilometers an hour. It just goes to show it's very difficult around this circuit. Well, it's a little bit of a hilly circuit. Technically, it is very difficult because here we have uh, Robbie McEwen in a little bit of a spot of bother here. He's picked up by Olano. And McEwen just about staying within the regulations there, I think. <laughs> staying within the regulations. But if it comes down to a sprint, I'm sure Robbie's going to get it. But second, the third time check on the on the course, Phil. Ulrich still the fastest, but only 35 seconds ahead of Tyler Hamilton. And Ekimov putting in a good ride. Third place there for him, 147 down. US Postal having a good tour. Here's Ekimov now as he gets to the finishing line. Hamilton's time of 116, but it looks as though Ekimov continued to slow a little bit over the closing kilometers. This is where Hamilton seemed to score his best rides. And Ekimov still riding, though, to give Postal a 1-2 in the finishing house at the moment. And Ekimov comes up 117.05, so they've got first and second place on the finishing line. But in fact, Ulrich, the only rider to beat one hour at the 45 kilometer check, and he's continuing to look extremely good. And it's over the last five or six kilometers that this, hurt, this course really hurts. That's where the biggest damage is done, and that's where most of the riders so far have in fact started to crack. And look at the time here. Ulrich is coming up. The time to beat is that of Tyler Hamilton, 116.35, and Ulrich is going to walk all over it. Well, between 45 and 53, Ulrich and Hamilton were riding at exactly the same speed, so he stopped picking up time on Hamilton, but it looks as though he's had a really strong finish. He must have been just relaxing a little bit over that third quarter, because now Ulrich is going to come in here and deliver the blow that everybody was worried about. Was he fit or wasn't he fit? Was he really overweight? Well, here comes his answer now because he's going to be the best time by Shaw. Ulrich then, the first man to knock Hamilton off the top of the leaderboard, 115.25, and nobody's going to beat that. Nobody will. 46 kilometers an hour, a remarkable performance by the man who's been dogged by overweight this year, and everybody said he couldn't get ready for the Tour de France, but I think he's answered all of his critics this afternoon. Well, 4.5 kilometers to go. It looks like Lawrence Jalabert further down the course here. But his time checks are slower than Jan Ulrich. It's a little rise here, then a drop down into the finishing town of Carez. This is a beautiful area of France. But here's the arrival now of Bobby Julik, another man who is confirming himself as a real challenger in the Tour this year. Third best at the minute, 116.43. Tough day for Stuart O'Grady, though, wearing the yellow jersey. He's last man to start on the road, and look at that. He's lost almost two and a half minutes now to Jan Ulrich. He won't be wearing the yellow jersey this evening, but he's had three glorious days. Jalabert coming up towards the finish. And another good ride from Laurent Jalabert, the new champion of France. Fourth slot for him. Alano, well, he's gone. He's done one on Alano because Alano's losing ground here again. It looks as though he's disappointing when it really matters. Abraham Alano races up towards the line. At the moment, he's holding sixth. He'll have to be careful. He could drop another place here as he comes up towards the finish. So Alano, once again, is not delivering the goods when it really, really matters. 1.17 and a little bit still to come. It must seem an awful long way to the line for him. He still holds on to sixth, 44.83 average. 
Well, look at that. George Hincap is coming up to the line. He's gone over in 120. Right behind him, the man who started last on the road, Stuart O'Grady. He's almost pulled back three minutes on the American. A good ride for him, Phil. 15th over the line. One minute, one hour, 1842. But a fantastic ride by Tyler Hamilton, I must admit, the revelation of this time trial this afternoon. A glorious ride by Tyler, getting second place, just a minute and ten seconds slower in the end than Jan Ulrich. And Bobby Julik in there as well. Is this going to be the year of the Americans in the Tour de France? But there is the rider, he's got the yellow jersey. Are we going to see him carry it all the way to Paris now? Jan Ulrich, just like Miguel Indurain did, has reclaimed yellow in a time trial. 118 ahead of Bo Hamburger, and the same time for Bobby Julik. Jalaber is still there, but the mountains are still ahead. Looking further down the list, O'Grady slips down to eighth place. Olano is there in ninth. And Evgeny Berzim, we haven't seen too much of him yet. He's hovering in 12th at 2 minutes and 40 seconds. And so we move on now to stage number 8. This is the beautiful town of Brive. We're heading now 190 and a half kilometers to Montauban. Very difficult day in store for these riders too because this afternoon it's going to be the hottest day of the Tour de France so far with temperatures creeping up to 40 degrees Celsius and for the first time this year the yellow jersey on the shoulders of Jan Ulrich. Stefano Zanini after Festina pulled out is the new leader of the King of the Mountains competition and that'll be quite a surprise for him. Well, he got the lead in Ireland, which seems an awful long time ago now, but it's just on one week since the race started and he's got back into the polka dot jersey more or less by default. First sprint of the day coming up here. Again, the break has gone clear. Interestingly enough, Jackie Durand leading them across there. This man is an aggressive rider. He's been on the attack since Ireland, looking for the right breakaway. And once again, he's got himself into a very good position. On the back there for Seiko is Eddie Mazzolini. And that breakaway forming almost immediately as they approach the sprint there. And he's still clear at the moment. And the big field look to me, Paul. They've assessed the riders in that break. And they don't seem to be reacting too much. Philippe Gomor coming across there, he's uh, riding for coffee disc, he's spotted that this is a very difficult move here and also making it across there, the champion of Italy, Andrea Taffy, reveling in these conditions this afternoon, going straight by that breakaway group there, joining onto the back wheel of Laurent Debian, the other rider from coffee disc, making two riders from that French team in the leading group. Well, after Jackie Durand, I reckon Andrea Taffy has been the most aggressive rider in this tour so far, always in our camera frame. But I have to say that Jackie Duran has been the aggressive rider. He's been in so many moves. And if you catch a glimpse of his number, then you'll see his number is red. That's a new uh, competition in the Tour this year, in as much that they give the red number to the man voted the leader of the most aggressive rider competition. And there's been no doubt it's been him. 16 and a half kilometers to go. Here we are now at La Francaise. And you can see now Philippe Gomor from Coffee Disc going to the front. He's decided now that his teammate Laurent Debian, the highest placed rider in the overall standings here, has a great chance of taking the yellow jersey. So he's just going to sacrifice himself, keep the pace high. And look at the time gap, Phil. 9.41. If they can hold on to a certain amount of this advantage, then Debian will be the new leader of the tour this afternoon. Well, this breakaway has been solid, but now the Onsay boys and the Telecom boys are trying to reduce the gap. It went up at one stage to 8 minutes and 25 seconds. It's now gone up to 9.24. So this is the day the Peloton are taking their tea break, I think. They've assessed that nobody can affect the overall lead because these riders have lost big time over the period. But, you know, what is going to happen, Paul, is that Ulrich has chosen, I think, not to defend his yellow jersey. He's going to lose his lead if this break stays at this sort of time gap. Well, none of these riders are men who really could stand up highly in the overall rankings of a three-week race like this. So Ulrich, I think, has decided to save his team a little bit because they've got another two weeks to work at the front, which is why he's given this group of riders their chance for glory. But it's all come back together under two kilometres to go now. And Andrea Tappi, very aggressive at the front, making sure that none of these splits go clear. Well, best place is Lauren Debian. He started the day four minutes and 30 seconds off yellow, and I don't know. He comes from northern France, actually, the coffee decider here, and surely he's not going to pull on the yellow jersey tonight. What a dream that would be. It certainly will be. In third position there, Laurent Debian looking over his shoulder, but Philippe Gomoy's teammate is no longer in this group. He did all of the work to make sure they could keep as much of their advantage as possible, and now he's just sat up and he's going to cruise to the finish. And the first of all attack comes here from Mazzolini. He's made the running now. They're all going to feel free to attack towards the finishing line. Tappy, as always, ever so vigilant, chases down another Italian. 
This has been a very hard stage, Phil. The real heat has come on the Tour de France this afternoon. Matt Zellini is being nailed back here by Andrea Tappi, but you can see just how difficult it is, and that looked like Yuna Luke had just gone off the back there from Lotto after his earlier attack. They're all back together again, and in control, Andrea Tappi. And maybe Yuna Lauka will get back on because he's keeping his head down for the Lotto boys. Joined the Lotto squad this year. Ex-Festina ride. I bet he's glad he made the change. And now Taffy at the front, now looking over somebody else to making the run. Well, the last news we had on the peloton, they were 8 minutes 15 seconds down, which means if it stays like that, Debian is racing to the yellow jersey in any case. So thoughts of Ulrich leading this tour to the finish. Well, they're out the window now. But there'll be a little time lost on the sprint here because the playing cat and mouse, Taffy has been forced to lead it out he's not a brilliant sprinter he likes to win alone former double classic winner andrea taffy and he's now going for the line here but it looks to me as though taffy is going to be taken on by jackie duron duron is he going to get a stage win yes he is that's his third ever stage victory in a tour de france including a surprise win in the prologue a couple of years ago but and uh, Jackie Duron, Paul, well, it, I think it's absolutely just after being given the most aggressive ride applies virtually every day of this tour so far. And a well-judged sprint, too. You see, Taffy was forced after chasing all those breakaways to lead out the sprint, but at the end of it, Jackie Duron waited to the very last minute using a huge gear. He comes over the top of the Italian. He judged it to perfection, and certainly I don't think anyone can say that he robbed that victory this afternoon because he's been there since the very first day of this tour. So that's the result. Taffy gets second. All of those riders in the breakaway. Now we're on to stage nine. Overall, Laurent Debian, the new leader of the tour. At midday today, it was into the cauldron of the Tarn, the ninth stage of the Tour de France, heads for the mountains. A daring escape yesterday gave the race its sixth leader. Laurent Debian brought the smiles back to the French. He leads the Italian Andrea Taffy by 14 seconds. Stage winner Jackie Durand by 43. Jan Ulrich slips to fifth. 3 minutes, 21 seconds down. So Laurent Debian goes to Poe in yellow, but is he good enough to win overall? And the answer is probably no. 127th last year, he has no known climbing ability. And in fact, yesterday, he found himself in the right place at the right time. The Cofidis team, in fact, had attacked, thinking only of winning the stage. Instead, they got the bonus of the leader of the Tour de France. Jan Ulrich's telecom team, well, they decided not to chase. They saw the right combination in the breakaway to take all of the pressures off their team captain. The yellow jersey is the marked man of the tour, and in hot, humid conditions, it made sense to allow move to succeed, providing it contained none of the accepted long-term candidates for the win. Telecom succeeded in turning the attention to the Cofferty's team, hoping now to give Ulrich an easier ride to the base of the Pyrenees. It means the tiring presentations and photographs fell to Debian for some hours last night, but for the tour first-timer in yellow, he loved it and will lead on the road to Poe today. It's going to be a very difficult day on the road to Poe as well. Racing conditions of sunny and once again high temperatures, 40 degrees Celsius and hardly any wind in the air. And Lord Debian, the sixth different leader of this year's Tour de France. The record, by the way, is eight, and that was set in 1987 when Stephen Roach ran out the winner of the Tour de France. But despite the conditions today, and you can see they're pretty warm, one man who isn't going to make it, Mario Cipollini, has retired. But even so, we thought you'd like to know a little bit more about him. three days long, Chippo has never made it past the first fortnight. Of course, he usually enjoys himself while he's here, modelling a selection of his holiday outfits and descending on French finish lines like something that's come not only to win the stage, but destroy local crops. M molti giovani seguono quella che è la mia tendenza, cioè il ciclismo colorato, il ciclismo diverso. Cipollini ha portato colore diverso, fantasia, e mo di modo che abbiamo... In five tours so far, though, Mario has never got further than stage 11. Perhaps he just doesn't like being away from his clothes. Faccio 40 vestiti in ogni stagione. Le scarpe hanno 400 paia. Ma io ho dovuto cambiare casa per riuscire a mettere tutte le cose in abbigliamento, le camicie, gli abiti, le scarpe. Sono è una mia vera passione. 
Certainly he seems to perform better when his wardrobe's close by, having completed his home tour of Italy and won 25 stages along the way. This year he managed four, celebrating Formula One style and donning the Mayo Ronaldo in honour of his favourite footballer. Unfortunately for him, he had about as good a weekend as Ronaldo, starting with his prediction of a Brazilian World Cup win. Je pense que gagner le Brésil. Combien? Deux, deux. In fact, 2-1 turned out to be his ratio of crashes to wins in the opening week, although of course he has the chance to equalise today. The Tour's most glamorous sprint, though, is the final one on the Champs-Élysées, and the Tour's most glamorous sprinter knows that until he completes the race, that will always elude him, along with the one item of clothing that his hefty contract can't buy him. Sì, è l'unica maglia importante nel ciclismo europeo che mi manca nella mia collezione. Devo arrivare in Parigi, possibilmente maglia verde e vincere l'ultima tappa a Parigi. Sarebbe una realizzazione professionale veramente importante e anche qualcosa di personale importante. Well, it won't happen now for Mario Cipollini, but what a character. We've come to the sprint here in Po now, and Leon Van Bon is going to take it out. Well, he's waited a long time. He rode his first tour in 1994. In fact, he's never finished the Tour de France yet. He gets the stage win, and Laurent Debian has brought the race to the foot of the Pyrenees as leader. 14 seconds ahead of Taffy, Giron, Lauca, Ulrich. Poised there in fifth place now to grab back the Mayo Jean. Olano's big day is coming. He lies 12th. Bjorn Reese, the 96 winner, is 25th. And Marco Pantani continues to ascend. He's now up to 47th, but 8 minutes 25 seconds off the pace. Well, this is what they've been waiting for, uh, Paul. Po to Luchon, 196 kilometers, 168 riders left in the race. But I don't think they were expecting this, Phil. The weather has changed dramatically overnight and the rain clouds have come down and the top of the climbs, very misty indeed. And it may well be the last day in the yellow jersey for Laurent Debien. Hardly any wind, but you can see the temperature has dropped almost 20 degrees Celsius overnight. Today, it will only be a high of 20. And well, you can tell Paul Show is not a gambler because I'll guarantee that it'll be the last day for Laurent Debian in yellow with the Col de Bisque, the Col de Tourmalet, the Col d'Aspin, and then we go over the Col de Pelsord. Look at the conditions here on the Obisque. Well, Cedric Vasseur going over the top there in first position, but Rodolfo Massi from Casino accelerating behind, looking for second place over the top of this mountain and trying to get in terms with him, his own teammate, Alberto Alli. But on the descent, Phil, the first serious crash. Casa That's Grande. Francesco Casagrande. Casagrande is down, the leader of the Covidis team. There's a number of riders gone down here now. Well, all the way over the top, everybody was warned of the treacherous conditions on the descent. And now just look at this. Riders are sprinkling like confetti all over the edge of the obisque and there's a number of retirements being announced as well you can see Vasseur's taking it very carefully on that descent but in fact Casagrande has gone down a second time there 16th overall this morning he was hoping to climb up in the standings today but I think Phil he's taking a beeline for the team car well that is a great shame here but this time I think Casagrande is a little bit injured on that second fall his teammate's been told to ride on and hopefully get through the time gap because, of course, eliminations do apply. That's Nicolas Jalabert. Now, look at this. Here are the lists out on the obese. Conish, Brunil, Fanini, etc. We're moving up towards the top of the Col du Tourmalet here. This is the high point in the Pyrenees at 2,115 metres, Paul. Alberto, Eli, Vasseur and Massey are still clear. A great move by Casino. They got two riders in the front group. Cedric Vasseur, I wouldn't have expected to see him on a stage like this, but he certainly is a courageous rider. Leading them over the top is Alberto Eli, just ahead of Vasseur, and somewhere in the mist, Massey takes third spot. Well, Cedric Vasseur is turning out to be quite a conqueror of the Pyrenees today. Here's the main peloton. Well, it's hardly a big field anymore now. It's been stripped by a number of riders. We understand another faller out on the obese too, Abraham Olano, but he continues. There's the order over the top of the Col de Tourmalet and uh, 120 kilometres, that's 76 kilometres still left to ride. This now is the top of the Col d'Aspin and again a sprint and it looks as though Massi Vasseur and Eli detach slightly from those two front runners. Now Ulrich taking over control at the front of the group now. All of his teammates have done their job perfectly this afternoon and now's the time when he has decided to put his hand on the Tour de France and assert his authority. Looking over to see what sort of damage is being done and right on his wheel, Giuseppe de Grande of Mappé. 
And the tempo has picked up the first of three because this is Ellie now coming back into the fold. Massey and Vasseur are still up the head, but they're closing in pretty rapidly. And you have to say now that uh, Jan Ulrich is looking every bit the defending champion of this year's Tour de France. He is just sitting at the front, taking out a pace there, making sure that nobody attacks him. In second place, De Grande. Right behind there as well, another telecom rider, Bjarne Reese, and Escartine in the green jersey of Kelme, riding an excellent Tour de France. And still in there, Bobby Julik. Uh, Leonardo Pipili also here, but you know, uh, looking at the face of Brianna Rees, we only see it occasionally. He looks as though he's really suffering right now and uh, having a tough time of it. Alano is missing from this group. Pantani is here, uh, but Alano a faller today as well. Conditioned a little bit better here on the pair of sword, which incidentally was where Tom Simpson lost his yellow jersey in the Tour de France back in 1962. That's uh, the only time a British rider ever worn the yellow jersey. No help at all coming to Jan Ulrich at the moment. He's showing that he is the main contender for this year's Tour de France. Just on the back there as well, that was Luke LeBlanc riding for Palti. So really, as Jan Ulrich has said, this is the most important day when the big hitters are going to come out and play. There's the Pirate. There in the yellow jersey of Mercatoni Uno is Marco Pantani. And on the back of the group, you can see what sort of damage is being done. And Bobby Julik in there as well. But if you want to know where the yellow jersey is, the last time check we got on Laurent Debien, he was 26 minutes behind this group, and I think he'll be even further than that right now. Great to see Marco Pantano. We haven't seen him at all in the Tour de France, and this is the first time he's, in fact, got out of the saddle, and this is an attack by Pantani. I thought he was just going to move to the front, but he's decided this is the time to go. Well, Marco Pantani has waited for the mountains for just over a week, and now he is beginning to sprout his wings again and go for the summit. He's got to go early on this stage because he'll need a good descent down into Luchon for the stage win, and he has to catch the leaders on the road yet. There are still two of them. Massey is ahead. Vasseur is also ahead, but Pantani has opened the gaps because Ulrich could not respond after setting the pace like that. Ulrich was not the only person who couldn't respond there. In fact, I think most of the riders in the group looked the other way when Marco Pantani attacked because nobody has the acceleration that this little man from Italy has when it comes to attacking on these climbs picking his way through the motorbikes and fairly sure quite round the corner there he'll be seeing Cedric Vasseur Vasseur just hoping I think to get over the summit still with a slight advantage over the group but Massey's doing the ride of his life well, Massey is unbelievable today because he's now shed Cedric Vasseur. There's Vasseur just to the other side of the motorbikes. The crowd enormous here on the Parasaur, despite the finish only just over the top. You've got a descent of some 15 kilometers once you're over the top of this climb. Vasseur has ridden great today, but he was never going to hang on to the pirate. Wasn't much chance to even say ciao there as Marco Pantani flies by. Just one man left up the road and the gap around about 35 seconds. So Pantani has a great chance of pulling back Massey before we get to the top of the Col de la Persaud. Well, he certainly looks good now, Marco Pantani. He was almost last in the prologue in Dublin. That sort of indicated he had no real interest in winning the Tour de France, but he said he wanted to win stages, and now this is his first chance. But he is finding the defiance from Rodolfo Massey something of a problem. Massey is still clear. We can't see him, Paul, but he's around about 40 seconds in front. This is what Marco Pantani's looking for now. One kilometre left to go to the summit, and then it's all downhill to the finish line. So Pantani is a fairly good descender when it comes to finishes like this, so he may well still have a chance of picking up Massey on the run into the finish. But look at the damage he's done behind. Nobody in sight. Well, Vasseur has been quickly dispatched down the line there to the chasing group, which still contains Ulrich. Let's go further on, because this is Rodolfo Massey. Casino continuing their incredible season, which has taken them right up the team rankings in the world to number two. And now all of those peaks are behind the race today, and they won't be unhappy about that. The Obisque has really turned this Tour de France around with Alano crashing. Casa Grande now out of the Tour, the leader of Cofidis. Good news for them is Bobby Julix riding pretty well. He's in that chase group along with uh, Jan Ulrich and also Luc Leblanc. But this man is going so well, and this rider here is not really catching him. Amazing, because it looks as if he's going so much faster than Massey, but Massey's holding on to that slender lead. This is the group behind, a good move there, sitting in back position, wearing number 51, Bogard, the champion of Holland. He's happy to be in the group with Jan Ori, but over the top, Massey still has an advantage over Marco Pantani. And the Pirates are getting into top gear now because he's got 15 kilometres all downhill, just 10 miles to try and get across and do what he wants to do in this year's Tour de France. That's win all of the mountain stages. But I think he'll be a bit surprised by the form of Adolfo Massey today. 
Over the top there, Massey's done enough now to claim the lead in the King of the Mountains competition. He was up there in second place over the Obisque. He was third over the Col de Tourmalet. He won the climb of the Aspin. He won the climb of the Pair of Sword. There's a lot of points in the bag there. This, the chase group, Rue Leblanc, De Grande, Ulrich, they're all in that group. And this rider has managed to get away. Now, can he use his descending skills? And they are considerable. Can he cross the gap? At the top, it was 38 seconds. Well, the great thing about the first part of the descent of the Perisord is it's so open, you can actually look across the bends and see what advantage you have or disadvantage on a rider up the road. And in fact, I'm sure Marco Pantani can see Rodolfo Massi, and he just has to judge the corners, but Massi is making an incredible descent. Look at the speed here. He's tipping 100 kilometers an hour. That's 62 miles an hour on this descent, so Marco Pantani is going to have to do something very special to pull back the lone leader. Well, he's going to have to take a few risks, and I hope he's checked his brakes because these corners are pretty tight as he goes down the mountain. But, you know, Marco Pantani is going to have to do something, I think, impossible to close the gaps at those sort of speeds. He's trying to get the most out of his slipstream here, and he'll have to watch where he sits for the next few minutes. A very risky position to get yourself into. Ten kilometres remaining for Adolfo Massi, and still the time gap is not coming down. The last split we had over race radio was 35 seconds on Marco Pantani, so it's staying exactly the same down this descent. Well, we've had him at 38 seconds over the top. Well, they've given us 35 seconds on the descent, and it's gone back to 36 seconds now. So we can say they are coming into Luchon locked at the same distance apart here as they were at the top of the climb. What's the latest time check on the board? I couldn't quite get a glimpse of that, Paul, but it was close. 35 seconds, I think it said on the board there. Massey now starting to hurt. He's been away since the 54th kilometre when they got away on the Col de Lobisque, and he rode across with his teammate to Cedric Vasseur. They joined up on the descent of that climb and then he's been in front ever since the top of the Perisord and now he's really pushing himself to try and stay clear of Marco Pantani. Well, some of the teams have lost their big names today because Buena Hora has also gone out and we fancied him in the mountains but the weather proved too bad. A glacial descent. Now it looks as though Rodolfo Massi might have a touch of cramp in that leg but it shouldn't matter now because he's not very far to go to complete the descent down into Luchon. The last winner here, by the way, was the British rider Robert Miller back in 1983. That looks like Ulrich there is trying to do something special as well. Now, has he got away from them on the top of the climb? Well, Ulrich trying to keep the pace up high, being chased down by Michael Boga there and coming up Jose Maria Jimenez of Banesto. He realises now how important it is to try and chase back Marco Pantani. He realises the danger of a man like this in the mountains. He doesn't want to give him too much of an advantage on any of these mountain stages because Pantani will be climbing up in the overall standings. He knows you can deal with Pantani in the time, Sars, but you've got to keep your options open on the descents here now. But Massey is heading down towards the victory. There's no real gains coming from Marco Pantani. He's approximately only 25 seconds ahead, too, of the Ulrich group now. Well, in fact, a lot of energy going into this chase by Marco Pantani, and he's not getting the big times that he wanted to, but what he's thinking about now is winning the stage down in Luchon. And for the moment, kilometres are ticking away. Two kilometres to go for this man at the front, Rodolfo Massey, and it's all flat now down to the finish line. It gets a little bit easy to say the least now. A sharp right here. It's a flat road. Bears round to the left and goes into this lovely little spa town. Ulrich has been handled by the rest of the group. Luc Leblanc has come back up. And they're all back together again in the chase. There's only about six or seven of them left, though, from the peloton today. As now, this is the part you can actually sit up and enjoy now. Massey looked clearly over the cars then. He won't have seen Marco Pantani. As he now goes down through the centre of Luchon and turns towards the finish. This is going to go down as one of the greatest wins of his career. By the way, here's a rider who hasn't ridden the Tour de France. I think 1990 was the last time that he, he rode the Tour de France. He's back big time now, though, as Massey comes up towards the line. This is going to be only win number 11 of his career. Rodolfo Massey, the new leader of the King of the Mountains, gets the stage in Luchon. The clock starts now. And here's the approach of Pantani, Paul, but there's still a long way to go to the line. There certainly is. Pantani tried. He moved at the right time on the, the Col de la Perisord there. He thought he had the advantage. He thought with the speed that he has on the climb that he could pull back the lone leader. In fact, he wasn't able to over the top of the climb. It was 31 seconds. And still Pantani forcing himself to keep up the pace because he wants to get to the finish line. All he can think about now is the advantage he's going to get over the Jan Ulrich group, which is closing on him quite rapidly too. 
So a second place to Marco Panzani, just over 20 miles an hour despite the crossing of these huge giant coals today, incredible speeds. This toy is still on a record schedule, by the way. Here's the race now for third place. Ulrich leads them out. But Michael Bogart, who's trained specifically for the tour, second time champion of Holland, and he's now going to take out the sprint, being challenged by Bobby Julik and De Grande. Bobby Julik's coming good. Can he hold it? But Bogart just on the line from Bobby Julik. But Julik really has found himself in this week of racing in the Tour de France. Well, the happy, sorry, Paul, the happy face there of Adolfo Massi. And he is now the winner of the stage by 36 seconds in the end. But you see, Bogart brought the rest in at 59 seconds. And so the new leader of the Tour de France is now Jan Ulrich. He is the man in yellow. Can he keep it?